Hi, everyone. I'm Christy Guevara, Director of Alumni Relations. Welcome to Learn Live from the same team who brought you Learned the podcast. This virtual series is an opportunity for us to continue sharing exciting stories about our alumni and incredible Oakwood community. I'm also joined by my co-host, Ivan Johnson, Director of Co-Curricular Programs. Today's guest is Jeremy Adler, an alum from the class of 99 and also a member of our Alumni Council. Jeremy is a culinary expert, restaurant consultant, and co-creator of Honey Bee Burger and Linnea. Thanks for being with us today, Jeremy. Hey guys, hello. Welcome to uh, the first and possibly only episode of me cooking on the camera. Um, I have two rules when it comes to cooking. Rule number one is you need to have your glass of wine within reach. And rule number two is you normally have to have good music around. Um, what's going on with all the situations has been really hard for me. I love having friends and family over and cooking for people. Uh, sometimes I have trouble finding the words to express love. So I do that through my food. And I think people can taste that. Um, we are cooking shrimp scampi today. It's one of those dishes that you can kind of just throw together um, and have shrimp in your freezer at all times and have some pasta. Um, you know, for me, when it comes to cooking and recipes, there's sort of frameworks. If you don't have spaghetti, you can use Capellini. If you don't have a long pasta, use a small pasta, a shorter pasta. No real rules that you have to follow. So these are some general ideas that we're gonna kind of go through, but feel free to mix it up. Um, there's no real firm set of rules. So we have some shrimp. Um, shrimp, uh, you can get them peeled, you can get them unpeeled. Definitely buy them frozen, um, unless you're gonna get really fancy scampi, uh, you know, fancy spot prawns from Santa Barbara. Um, you know, frozen and the fresh stuff that they have in the, in the, in the fish case, usually it's the same thing and they just charge you a lot more to defrost them for you. So if you freeze them, you can keep them in your house, you take them out, you put them in a bowl, you throw them under running water and then they defrost. So I'm gonna move this camera down so you can kind of see me cutting. And here you have a shrimp, right? Um, what's great about a shrimp is that when it's cooked, it curls, so you know it's done. So like uh, a friend of mine who were many nameless wanted to cook scampi for his late, his wife for Mother's Day. And he showed me a picture and they were cooked to hell. And you can tell they're cooked to hell because they were all shriveled up in pink. Right now they're sort of a grayish color. And when they're done, they're gonna be pink. So to peel them, you just kind of take that shell off, right? You pinch off the tail. We're gonna throw the shells into a hot pan with some oil because the shells themselves have a lot of flavor. Let me do one more for you. So again, you can just peel off the tail and then you take off the shell. And we put that in a pan with hot oil. Okay, so now you have your shrimp. On top of the shrimp, that's where the intestinal tract is. So all you gotta do, and I'll get up real close to the camera so you can see it, is run your knife around the back side of the shrimp. And sometimes they have uh, you know, stuff in them and sometimes they don't. This one has a little one. So you see that little thing right there? That's my daughter in the back. Right? So you kind of peel that little thing out. And that's basuda. It's the only part of the shrimp we're not gonna use. And same thing with the other one, one more time. So here you just take it and you run your knife along the back. And we look inside for the intestinal tract and we don't see it. So we take all those shells and we add them to oil and now we're just gonna cook them. So as we're cooking them, they're sort of frying up and then they're gonna go, I did it already because I want it on the interest of time. And they go from being sort of a pinkish color to a reddish color and they get from being soft to firm. And what we're doing is almost making like tea. And that tea is like infusing shrimp flavor into the oil directly. So then we're going to take that right there and we're going to strain it. So I'm going to take this strainer right on top, dump the oil in. Okay, make sure you use a spatula to get all those last little bits out because we're going to use the same pan. I'm going to try and use as few pans as possible tonight when I'm drinking. 
unlike most knights, that's what we want. You can take potato masher and smash away at the shrimp shell. Just extract all that flavor. And let me take the special here. Yes, Annabella. Your question. Yummy. Yummy, right. So, um, I also forgot to mention that we are heating up a, a, a pot of boiling water. When I first started cooking pasta, I used to add a boatload of water all the way to the top. Now I only add it halfway. You don't need to waste that much water. And, uh, you know, it gets hotter faster. And then just add some salt. So here we're going to take this kind of, if you can see, like inside the, the pan, you'll see that it's kind of got a pinkish hue to it, right? So we're going to add that oil back in. And let's see if you can see the color. See that kind of pinkish hue? That's from the shrimp shells. And it's got shrimp flavor now, too. So we're going to add that back in the pan. Okay, a cold pan, not hot anymore. All right, and we're going to leave that on the pot. Okay, the pasta that we're going to be cooking today is chitata, right? It's called chitata, that's Italian for guitar. Um, and it's kind of a square shaped noodle. It made in a, in a little machine that looks like a, a guitar. So we're going to rip that open. It takes, it's, the, the bag says nine to 10 minutes, so we'll probably cook it for like seven or eight, okay? That's where your iPhone or your phone uh, timer comes in handy. Probably, it says five portions per serving, so we'll do like half, half of that. There they are, dump that in there. Let it go for a second, and then we'll stir it up. Okay, back to the pan while that pasta's cooking. To the pan, we are gonna add some shallots and some chopped up fennel, okay? Chopped up fennel. Chopped up fennel. Bronze, bronze. bronze fennel, chopped up fennel. Little uh, salt, little pepper. All right, and we're going to put that on low heat. Can you see that right down there? Low heat. All right. And what, our goal is not to get a lot of color in there. We just kind of want to start getting, sweating them out. We don't want to get them too dark or too brown. Um, all those flavors are going to be really aggressive for the, for the uh, shrimp. And it's, we want the shrimp to shine here. So we've got that going. I add, I add a pinch of salt to sort of just start releasing some of that liquid into the pan and uh, just get that process going. Um, so yeah, so we've got the shrimp shells that we used. If, you, if, you're, if your shrimp don't have uh, shells, that's okay. Don't worry about it. If you don't feel like chopping up all those vegetables, they're only going to be prepped things like this, you know, and you can be done. Like you can have this, you know, on the table 15, 20 minutes. So food is a lot also about listening. Can you hear that? You hear that, that kind of sizzling? You can hear that when it's like starting to pick up. Hear that? It's really cool. Um, so kind of bringing some color into these. You okay, Annabelle? You want more first? Okay, all right. You want another ice cream? Go for it. So I'm also going to add a, a pinch of uh, red pepper just to get some Spice, nothing too crazy, because there is a child in the house, but just a little bit you won't really notice. Okay? So now you hear that sizzling going, right? We're gonna add the shrimp into the pan. All right? And the most important thing I can tell you, do not overcook the shrimp. We're also gonna add the garlic, okay? The reason I don't add the garlic until the last second is it's really aromatic for a very short period of time. And whoa, you got the mint chocolate chip, I love those. So if you add, if you add the garlic when you add the shallots, I think it actually cooks out a lot of the flavor. Um, so I add them kind of whiskey shrimp when it's not quite as um, hot. So here we go, you can just see the shrimp are starting to get a little color, you see? All right, it smells. Amazing. You want to see? Yeah, yeah, come on out of the Let me see. Just give the pasta a stir to make sure it doesn't stick. Mmm. Mm. Right? <laughs> and the, way, the other thing that's amazing about pasta, the shrimp, are when they start to cook, guess what? They curl up. So they're telling you that they're done. 
And the worst thing you can do is overcook the shrimp. You want to see yourself in the picture? Mm -hmm. Jumping up? Jump up. There you go. You want to say hi to Oakland Gaga? They're, they're back there somewhere. Abuela's there too. Abuela's there. There you go. So the other big thing to understand is when the shrimp are cooking, when you turn off the fire, you're going to add the pasta to the sauce, right? It's called, some people call it the marriage. The big thing is, is that you're going to cook those two together afterwards. So if you cook the shrimp to when they're done and then add the pasta, what do you have? You have overcooked dried shrimp. So you want to stop it when it's almost done. Um, it's called carry over cooking. And there's residual cooking from the heat of the pan and from the pasta itself that will continue to cook, you know, everything that's around it. And we don't want to do that. We don't want to end up with dry shrimp. We want to end up with juicy, delicious, fresh shrimp. Um, there's a few other things that we're going to add after it's ready. You're going to use a Meyer lemon, Meyer lemon zest, some butter, and a boatload of herbs. You know, I absolutely adore herbs. I don't think you can have too many. We're lucky we live in Southern California. I got like five or ten different kinds of herbs outside. Um, it just brings me joy. And it's like, it's got a lot of flavor. It's easy. It's fast. You know, and um, yeah, it's just absolutely delicious. So here we are. You'll see here again. We look at the shrimp. You'll see that the shrimp, that one looks like it's pretty much done. That one's still kind of gray you know, around the middle. So we're gonna like go a little bit longer, but we don't want to like overcook it. So if you're ever worried like, are the shrimp done and you're asking that question, they're probably done. Because we've been cooking these for like two or three minutes and they're basically there. Let's taste the pasta really quickly. <laughs> it's not done yet. Well, I'll get some to you when it's done. Um, but yeah, still crunchy. What do you want me to do? Those four circles are the logos of Oakwood. Why? Someone designed it. I, I, you know, I'm not really sure. Who. Can I cook again now? Is that okay? Can you go, you, all right, I'll let you go on the side. Um, so, yeah, so yeah, um, I added fennel as well because I want some of that fennel flavor. I think fennel and shrimp go great together. Um, but if you, don't have, if you don't like fennel, don't add it. If you don't like shallots, add regular onions, add red onions, add leeks. You know, if you don't want to use, you know, spring garlic is at the farmer's market right now. It's the kind of tail edge of the season. Um, I was actually there this morning. You know, some people think I'm crazy. Some people think I'm not. I haven't stopped going to the farmer's market since it's all started. Um, so now you look at it, right? We got shrimp that are curled. Okay. Some of them aren't cooked all the way. That's okay. I'm stopping. I'm done. I'm going to wait. We're turning off the fire, I'm going to wait for the pasta to be done, right? Because when I add that hot pasta, I'm going to add some pasta water, I'm going to add some butter, I'm going to emulsify those things together. Emulsify is a fancy term for kind of mix it up so that the water and the butter go together to make, and some oil go together to make a thicker liquid. Um, the other thing I'll show you, this is the coolest thing. This is a lid. It's a universal lid. So you don't have to buy 10 lids, you can buy one lid. It's from All Clad. It's by Thomas Keller. You guys have heard of him before, I'm sure. You know, I don't have a huge kitchen. It's bigger than I used to have, but you only need one lid, and then it works for all your pots and pans. Yes, my love. Yes. <laughs> okay, let's try another thing. Pasta. Which it? One more minute. One more minute. Um, I'm going to show you how to zest a, a, a lemon. So another piece of equipment I think is absolutely essential for cooking is this thing called a microplane, okay? This was used in woodworking, right? And then um, I think the wife of the owner kept cut, you know, cutting herself on it, and she needed something to grate cheese, and she used this, and that's all they make anymore. And I think it's called a rasp in making wood, and it's essential for grating chocolate, cheese, and lemon zest. Like if you look in my kitchen, you'll see so many lemons that don't have any zest on them anymore. I use lemon zest on absolutely everything. I think they're absolutely, it just brings brightness and freshness to everything you cook. So uh, you take the lemon and you run it and rotate it like this. And I always actually do this upside down. And the reason why I do it upside down is those essential oils are what we want, right? Those little yellow things. Like if you ever go to a fancy bar, they twist it and squeeze it and it makes a splash. That's the ignition of 
that kind of essential oil inside the zest. So we're gonna you know, take off the zest here, right? And I'm gonna add that to some herbs that I added. We have tarragon, we have the fennel fronds, so like that green part at the top of the fennel. If you chop that up really small, small you're using the whole thing. And again, I think that's really important all the time. I think that's particularly important now, right? Like I'm using the shells to flavor the oil. We're obviously gonna eat the whole shrimp. But like with everything, you don't want to waste anything. You know, stuff is so precious. It's really hard to get now. You know, so like even if you're making a roast chicken, use the bones to make a stock, that kind of thing. So now we have our mixture of lemon zest and chopped up herbs. Let's taste this pasta again. Can I try it? Oh, uh, yeah. Let me see. Here. There you go. Someone's hamming it up for the audience. What do you think, Annabelle? I think he's like one more minute. It's almost there. One more minute. You liked it? What's your favorite way to eat pasta, Annabelle? What's your, you like it? What's your sauce? What's your favorite sauce? Chocolate. Chocolate sauce with pasta? I don't know about that. You like carbonara? All right. We're almost done. Okay. So I'm going to take some of the pasta water, right? And save it. Here, let me turn it towards me. I'm going to take some of the pasta water and save it because we're going to add that to the uh, pasta sauce later. Right? That's really going to kind of help us with our sauce. I'm going to stick this in there, and I'm going to dump this in there. Let's straighten out. Okay. Don't spill pasta in your sink like I just did. All right, so we've got that. I'm adding the pasta to the spaghetti. Um, and now we're gonna bring them together, right? So we're turning that heat back on. Okay, add a little bit of the water. And we'll cook it for like a minute. And do a fancy toss. So the goal here is to like, you got all these chunky sh uh, shrimp, you got that shrimpy oil, you got that pasta. We have these two different flavors that we kind of want to bring together. And the way we do that is by cooking, finish cooking them together, but also kind of tossing and emulsifying um, those flavors into one so you end up with kind of a creamier sauce. All right. Um, like I was saying before, when it comes to going to the farmer's market, I haven't stopped. I want to support those farmers. I care about them very deeply. Um, and they haven't stopped growing food. The fishermen haven't stopped catching food. And the one good thing about all this is that, like, now you can get stuff directly from the person making it, whether it's cheese or meat or, you know, fish or vegetables or fruit. Um, the guy that I, that I buy pork from, he's been raising pigs, you know, two, three generations. And, you know, he sold to restaurants. Well, the restaurants stopped existing. He still had pigs to sell. So he started distributing them to various restaurants that operate as grocery stores or selling them directly to consumers. And I think the, the, the one, like, one of the only shining lights of this terrible situation is that you can now get the best stuff directly to your home. Um, he's actually probably not going to sell to restaurants anymore because you can charge more money to people than restaurants and, you know, you get to pay directly. It's just easier. And, you know, hopefully he'll still sell to me because his pork is absolutely amazing. So if you look here, you'll see that in the, in the corner of the pan, you probably can't see that, but there's like a little bit of liquid. And when you, you put it out of the way, you'll notice that there's a relative viscosity that is changing as it's cooking. Let's put it on the, the higher. That's the problem. I also recommend these little bay tongs. So like if you see them next to my hand, you know, I have decent sized hands, but it's the same size as a tong and it's really, really helpful. Um, the other tool I always use is a kunstspoon. So great kunst passed away not too long ago. Um, design these spoons, and they're absolutely amazing to uh, use them in his fancy restaurant, Les Pinas. I'm going to add a couple a couple tablespoons of butter to finish it off. You know. Okay, and you see how the, the shrimp are now cooked, right? Toss a little bit of that lemon zest and all those herbs. All right, we're running out of space. 
And then here we have the bowl. I think two ice creams is enough, Annabella, for one cooking demonstration. Come on. All right, so we got the lemon zest, we got the herbs, we got the pasta, the butter, and a last little drizzle of olive oil, because, you know, why not? This is a really good olive oil. It's on it, though. So uh, this is a really good olive oil. And bon appetito. Awesome. Thank you so much, wow. Jeremy. That was that was great. Looks I learned, delicious. Yeah, it looks so good. And and seeing your family is awesome too. Yeah. Um, you know, I think something. I mean, I've been cooking a lot at home and um, trying to support local farmers markets. And I live in Colorado. We have a bunch of ranches, and I I've, I've built relationships with those folks who used to serve the restaurants. And at the same time, I'm also mindful of the community space that restaurants create. And right now feeling that loss for sure. And just, I'm curious about like what you think we can do as a community in Los Angeles or, or New York or wherever we are to continue to support the restaurant industries around us. Sure. I mean, I, I think you just need to be considerate of where you spend your money. You know, your money is a vote every time. Your money is power. And, you know, like I am trying to buy less wine from like Whole Foods and Trader Joe's because I want to allocate those that money towards um, you know the smaller wine stores and smaller mom and pop shops that really need it right now. Right, they can't go to their their, their the stock portfolio to do a stock buyback or have a capital call and um, you know may or may not have investors and you know they, they just operate at thinner margins. So you know your money goes further with them and. Um, just be careful about that. You know, like I, I spend every Wednesday morning at the farmer's market in Santa Monica. Um, I'm fortunate that we live in uh, Mar Vista, which is not that far of a drive. The traffic is non-existent right now. Um, and then I go to like Trader Joe's or Whole Foods afterwards to kind of fill in the gaps. But I'm spending 80, 90% of my money directly to the person, right? Like I hand my money to the farmer. That's a direct relationship. And that's, there, there's joy in, for me personally, it also happens to be more delicious, right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, look at my refrigerator, right? Like, it's full. It's totally full of stuff. Come Tuesday next week, it's going to be empty. I'm going to use everything up, and we're going to do it again. And, you know, I probably gained 15 pounds since quarantine started. <laughs> that was a lot. And you know, my pizza, I suck at pizza. I've got, I just got a pizza peel. I just got a... Annabella, come on. Come over here. Say hi to them. You want to talk to them? How's the pizza? So, you know, I, I suck at pizza. I like I've been having a lot of pasta, a lot of risotto, just a lot of everything. You know? Man, this, this kid was probably like 75% of her DNA. It's from the farmer's market. And that's a point of pride, you know? And she eats everything, you know? She eats everything. And, uh, She's strong, in case you can't tell. <laughs> cool. That's amazing. Uh, Jeremy, I know that you mentioned that you're opening up the bar soon, or have you already? And how how are you? How is everyone feeling about that? Is everyone excited to get back to work? I mean, people in the hospitality industry have a tendency to be extroverts, so I'm definitely an extrovert. And uh, I'm like, what you this one is an extrovert too, and uh, you know, like they they miss people working. You know, they, they're like us. They've been at home. Everyone's been at home. We're social animals. Even introverts are like, enough's enough. <laughs> yeah, 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 thank you. You know, and uh, oh wow, the screen just won. It's over in like two minutes. I mean, it's fine. And, you know. It, there's this, I've been writing a, you know, a, a opening manual right now for like safety and security protocols. And if someone walks up to go into the bar, to place an order or go into the bar once we reopen July 4th and they don't wear a mask, what happens? Um, you know, we won't let them in. Well, what if they want to come in anyways? They need to call the cops. They need to call the cops because someone's not wearing a mask. 
And, you know, well, what happens if, and then we give them a temperature check. And we make them sign a declaration form that they haven't ha had or interacted with anyone with, you know, COVID for the last two weeks. So this is just a lot of work, man, just to go and have a drink. But yeah. these are like, what's going to happen? At least that's our protocol, because I'm going to be like, err on the side of caution on this one for now. Be, you know, for, for my health, for my daughter's health, right? Like that random person not eating, you know, not putting a mask on is going to affect my daughter, right? Like, and so that's on the negative side. On the positive side, and this is going to sound sort of hippie, so forgive me, but, um, you know, when you cook food for someone, you can affect their health directly, right? Like there's a level of, you know, may not think about it that much, but even a drink, there's a level of trust that when you walk in, consume something, you're expecting to be safe and healthy, right? And it's the case is, it's a two-way street. And that's just, the, it's always been the case, but now it's even more apparent, right? It's like, there's so much trust between these two strangers that never met each other that I'm making something for you that you're ultimately going to ingest. And it's going to become a part of who you are, you know, in, in a lot of different ways. And that's a delicate conversation and it's scary. It's scary to be back at you know, work. It's scary to be between the kitchen and the dining room in a tiny hallway that has two turns and like you can bump into someone and how you maintain social distancing when you're bringing out food to people in a small space, which is most restaurants, I don't know. Um, but you know, I look, I think you look at other parts of the world that have already done this and you see what they're doing, right? Cause we're not the first canaries in the coal mine and people are going out. I just got off the phone with someone before this that um, they, they were at a pool bar in Arizona and Arizona doesn't have a mask requirement and people were like out and about. And that's not even Memorial Day, right? Memorial Day is the stuff where he's like, it's going to be crazy. And, you know, we're social animals and we miss people. And, you know, the logical side of you is like 99.6% or something and people are going to be fine. You know, we're only worrying about a 0.4% problem. It's a huge problem. And, you know, I don't think that there's a right or wrong answer in any of this stuff. I think it's the least bad answer. But I think that, you know, the other thing that's happening in the hospitality industry that no one's talked about is there are um, a lot of employees that are not making unemployment, getting unemployment because they're not legally allowed to. Mm -hmm. So they go into yeah. this and they have for 20 years, right? They've been paying unemployment because they get paid on their paychecks for 20 years and they're not making any money back. And how are they surviving? Well, if some of them are driving for, you know, Uber Eats and picking up your groceries at, you know, Instacart and whatnot, but I have other guys that I've loaned money to personally and they need to go back to work and like to feed their kids. So like, it's, hmm. it's not simple, right? Like I'm not trying to suggest that it's the health of my staff against, you know, the, the kid of one of my barbacks being fed. You know, but, it, you know, it's a messy, it's a messy conversation. And, uh, you know, but I think we all miss restaurants. Like, I love them so much. I run them, <laughs> on them. There's something so theatrical about the right ones. And, you know, food and music and aesthetics and a vibe and a space and lighting. Man, can they be transportational, right? It just can take you to whole different places, all different worlds. And that connection with people. Is, is just core to who we are. And uh, I miss it so much. It was my birthday yesterday. You know, I had leftovers with my nice. wife and my daughter. <laughs> and it was nice. But I'm like, next year I'm turning 40. I'm throwing, I can swear now because my wife, but my daughter's wearing her phone. I'm going to throw the biggest fucking party ever next year. <laughs> I'm going to end up on the floor of my bathroom at 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Thing, I'm not drinking ever again. And anything less than that, I and, and I didn't do good enough because I haven't done that in a while, in a very long time. I, and I miss my and text messages from friends are nice, and that's usually what you get on your birthday, anyways. But like for somehow, some way, it's it's like it's lacking. You know, like I miss my friends, I miss my family, I miss having everyone around. My wife and I just finished like resanding and finishing a table that we have in our backyard finally after four years of living here, and like I want people around. This, yeah. Like yeah. Do. And it's just it brings me joy, central to who I am, you know, and it's going to happen. It's going to happen again. And July 4th is not that far away. And the funny thing is, is like, and this is the best allegory I can, I was talking to the, one of the guys at the farmer's market this morning. Because how many farmer's markets have I been to since this started? Six, seven, eight, 
something like that. The first time I went, so it was so weird. This place that I was so I get I get excited to go to the farmers market. It brings me joy. I I, I really love it. And because like you see these things and you taste them and the colors and the smells and like all the other chefs are there. It's like the best thing ever. And the first time I went after this happened, I had to wear a mask. I wore gloves. I waited in line for an hour to get in. It was crazy, right? And it was just, I felt uncomfortable. It was awkward. This place that had brought me so much, you know, special, you know, so much of a special emotion, um, you know, is different. Well, now seven or eight weeks later, I waited in line for 45 minutes to go this morning. I'm like, yeah, it's part of it. I, you know, I brought in my extra battery charger for my cell phone. So I did. <laughs> like I parked closer because I knew I was going to buy more stuff because I'm not going to the restaurants anymore. So I could go back and forth and drop off, you know, I brought, uh, you know, three, I brought four, you know, cardboard trays of stone fruit and berries. Like it, right now the season is just amazing. The apricots, peaches, nectarines just came in like the second or third week. The cherries are just like right in the sweet spot. The strawberries are finally worth the price that they're charging. You know, it's just like, it's, and I'm used to it. And I find that joy's back. It's back. I had joy going there today. Wearing a mask, you know, I didn't wear gloves today, but wearing a mask, waiting in line 45 minutes to get in, I changed. And it took seven or eight times, but now I'm like, it's back. And I think the same, the first time you go to a restaurant or a bar, I'm like, this is the same thing that's going to happen. You're going to be like, this is weird. Right, like, like I'm not used to this, but we get used to stuff pretty quickly, and I think, you know, we'll get used to this too. I really believe that. So yeah. thank you, yeah, 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 thank you. I think it's 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 nice to hear a perspective that doesn't feel so polarized, right? That it's just trying to like look at and just accept that this is a super complicated conversation, and it doesn't need to be right or left or blue or red or any of that nonsense. It's just people trying to figure it out in all these different cities and food is central to like this problem. Um, and it's, problem? it's complicated. Yeah, but food's a unifier. Food brings people together, you know? Yeah, like, totally. Definitely. Yeah. Like from the Valley who went to Oakland. So you can imagine which side of the political spectrum I sit on. Right. Having said that, if I broke bread with someone from the opposite side, and we started talking about food and we didn't touch politics, we would just talk about Right, and right. That's, I love that. And like the other things, like we're mostly the same. Even like whoever the opposite person in the world is, we're still mostly the same. You know, like they love their kids just as much as I do. They want to do right by their family as much as I do. And, you know, like, uh, did you guys read that article? Um, it was on my news feed like a couple weeks ago. These five kids got stranded on an island, right? And like, they said, this is a real story. I think in the, what, what year was it, honey? It was like in the 60s or 70s? I don't know, but it, it's kind of like Lord of the Flies. Yeah, and you think it's Lord of the it's, Flies? It's not Lord of the Flies? No. <laughs> <laughs> this is Lord of the Flies. They were they worked together. These were teenage boys. They worked together. They had different responsibilities. And they built a small community, five guys on this, like, deserted island. And, like, you know, I think humanity in the right circumstance works out that way. I, you know, I'm an optimist, ultimately. Um, you know, I'm worried about this happening, you know, there being a second resurgence. I'm worried about all that stuff. Um, yeah, I've been drinking a lot of wine. <laughs> when we bring it yeah. it makes the clanking sound, you know. Like yeah. My wife, in a week, we're going through how many bottles of wine? Like, honestly, how many? What do you think? <laughs> Awesome. Well, on that note, I think I'm going to go grab a beer. Um, thank you so much for your time, Jeremy. <laughs> thank you so much, Jeremy. It was wonderful. Good to see you guys. Um, for everyone watching, stay tuned for our next episode of Learn Live on Wednesday, June 3rd. Mike Gedick, another member of the class of 99, will be showing us how to organize our digital lives. Thanks again and see you next time.